So um, I'll probably present a little bit more of an optimistic view. Uh, but, <laughs> <laughs> um, but having said that, I, I don't think it's that optimistic view uh, painted. But um, I think we're going to get the broad cross spectrum of views today. So, um, so I mean, we've been asked to talk about two questions. Can the Eurozone survive its crisis and what's the real nature of the challenges? And I, I guess I just have to start by saying I'm not quite convinced that it's an actual Euro crisis, that is a, a crisis of the currency per se. I think that the whole idea of the Euro crisis is to some degree a construction from uh, Anglo-dominated uh, financial markets, um, which have always hated the Euro. They've always uh, felt that there was a threat against the US dollar and the, um, and the pound. Um, and I also think a largely um, British uh, Eurosceptic uh, press has contributed to it quite significantly. And in fact, here in Australia, we really get our news from the UK. And I think it's been pointed out that, um, and I'm not sure what exactly what these figures are, but um, it's been pointed out that of the thousands and thousands of um, foreign correspondents based in Brussels, that none of them are Australian. So we get all of our media from, from the UK, which, of course, are so Eurosceptic so you're a hostile that they're kicking and screaming and causing huge dramas as well, threatening to leave, which um, I think is going to just dig their own grave. And um, quite frankly, I think they should just move on and just do it and get it over time. But anyway, um, so essentially what I'll move on to is just to sort of talk about what some of the, what sort of crisis I think it is. Um, and then also sort of talk about the response um, that uh, has been coming from the leaders of the Commission. Um, so, essentially, as I said, I don't believe it's a Euro crisis, and the reason is because, um, although I do think the, the currency was um, introduced way too early, um, before a fiscal union was established, before a transfer union was established, um, and also before they could establish the sort of tax regime that is fit and proper and appropriate for what the European Union is today, which is arguably it's basically halfway to a federation. I mean, it's, a, it's literally probably more more than a, halfway there. So there's you know there's a lot of unfinished business, and I think that that's sort of quite um, uh, fair enough because after you know the European Union was essentially set up in a very rudimentary form after the Second World War to create a long lasting sustainable peace in Europe. So I mean the only alternative was at that point they said let's federate like the United States, but of course very different. 60 years ago. So, you know, it, it's it's an ongoing process and it's a matter of building things. So they couldn't just do all of that together. But nevertheless, they introduced, I think, the currency a little bit too early. Um, I think a lot of that was French optimism at the time. Um, and, uh, I mean, the thing is, is that, you know, if economic growth is quite strong and you've got good e income coming in, then paying your debts is really not a problem. Um, and indeed, when economic growth was really high in the mid 2000s. No one was running around saying there's Euro crisis. I mean, everybody was happy, happy, happy. But people were building houses in Spain. Um, so, uh, you know, it's only when times go bad that all of a sudden it's the crisis, the Euro crisis. Um, and I think the real problem is that there's essentially a lack of growth. And there's a whole lot of issues that need to be addressed as well. But, um, uh, and also, too, I have to say that debt levels were just as high as they were before this crisis um, uh, developed as well. So, um, you know, it's not as if debt levels have, I mean, they have increased significantly in recent, in recent years, <coughs> but, you know, they were nevertheless quite high. In fact, uh, last decade, they were much higher in Belgium than they are now. So, <coughs> you know, debt is, is, is an ongoing issue. Um, uh, and it's certainly not so much of a problem now in countries that have high levels of growth, well, what I call comfortable levels of growth, like uh, Slovakia, Germany, and Estonia, which is sort of like there, um, and you know, in, in actual fact, most of the European Union things have started to change since these figures have come out. But most of the European Union is kind of, in terms of growth, not too bad. It's going on moderately, um, and uh, it also has to be pointed out that a lot of the uh, economic growth that is happening in some of these countries, particularly Germany, is export-driven growth. So Germany actually owns countries like Greece a huge favour. Actually, because if um, the euro, if, if some of these countries weren't in the, uh, to drag the euro value of the euro down, then um, Germany's exports would be um, hit quite severely, and they wouldn't be anywhere near as strong as they are now. 
Um, and um, if Germany indeed left the euro, for example, um, and none of this is ever going to happen, but, just, <laughs> but if they did, if they did, the German Deutsche Mark would be basically like the Swiss franc on steroids, and it would literally be absolutely through the roof. And I mean, you know, the Swiss franc has been at the highest, some of its highest historical levels ever in recent years, and it's absolutely destroyed, well not destroyed, but it's very severely hit the um, Swiss export. Switzerland also depends on exports as well. And um, the Swiss bank, uh, Central Bank, had to jump in and, and, um, and flood the market the Swiss banks to try and bring the value down. So um, that's what would happen in, in June. So, you know, you, you need strong currencies, in, 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 but, you know, they're all working together. They need each other, basically. Um, and nor do I really believe, actually, people, the argument for countries like Greece leaving the Euro is that they can devalue their currency and become more, more competitive, which I don't really think stands up because, I mean, who really believes that if, you know, you, you return to Greece, returns to the drag market, which to start with, is, there's been estimates it would possibly devalue its currency by 40%. So that automatically means that it's uh, cost of energy, all of the oil and gas for the imports, because it's, you know, everybody knows Greece is a desert, basically. So we've got no natural resources. So the it's um, a cost of energy is going to go up 40 percent. So that's not going to make it terribly competitive. And of course, there's the other problems such as no one will ever lend money again. Inflation will go through the roof. Um, and who really believes that you know um, a little bit of a boost from its tourist industry and um, olive oil and maybe yogurt is really going to make the poor Greece out of economic trouble? And I'm not sure. That's going to work. So, so I think that that whole economic, it is an economic argument, is actually quite flawed. Um, but depending on your view whether you think the EU will eventually federate or not, which I don't think it will, um, then you really can, what the, the way that I think you can also see is the problem is that it's not yet federated. If it was, then some of these problems <coughs> perhaps wouldn't be there. Um, and, uh, you know, if it was part of a transfer union, such as um, uh, the United States of Australia, or as, where essentially you have, uh, you know, poorer, or wealthier states effectively subsidising um, poorer states, I mean, that's what it comes down to. That's the price of becoming part of a united country. Um, so, um, I think that's essentially one of the fundamental flaws. Um, and nor do I think really this crisis at the moment is one debt levels, which have been um, higher even higher, as I said, in a lot of, you know, uh, in a lot of countries. Um, this is just a graph of um, where all the debt is. Um, uh, for countries like uh, Ireland, for example, most of it's in their banks, financial institutions. Um, but for other countries, um, and, and contrast uh, some of the EU countries to, to countries like Japan, which has got uh, its, its debt is, um, I mean, the EU as a whole is around about 82% of the GDP, which is nowhere near as bad as the US, which is uh, 102%. And, or even Singapore, actually, which is, whose debt's about 100% of the GDP. And certainly not Japan, which is, um, which is uh, uh, at 226%. So, I mean, that's not to say that meeting debt obligations is not a challenge <coughs> for some countries, because it is. Um, for the countries with the highest unemployment, poorest revenue, raising capacity, big deficits, then debt, debt levels are, uh, are obviously a problem. And the countries with the biggest um, deficits are Ireland, Greece and Spain, uh, and, and actually the UK, and only Sweden, Hungary and Estonia are in the surplus of the end of the year. The highest risk of default is in Greece, Italy, Spain, Cyprus and even France. Um, but again, I, I would have to ask, you know, what price are these wealthy countries going to pay to have this long-lasting sustainable peace in Europe? I mean, this right. might sound very controversial to some people who feel that, you know, some people feel, why should we have to pay for people with, and, you know, all these other problems? And I mean, you know, indeed there are legitimate, there are big concerns about corruption and some of the restructuring that some of these states uh, need. But, you, you know, I mean, the thing is, is if you're going to be in a family together, then that's what you do. So, you know, sort of, 
So, you know, this, if, if, if you believe that it's, it's a federation, it's going to move to a federation, this is what people are going to come. Everybody needs to come to terms with. Um, but nevertheless, um, just talking, going back to the risk of default. So, it is quite high in Greece, Portugal, but also true in uh, other countries like Argentina, um, Egypt, uh, Dubai. So, there d doesn't seem to be, I mean, going back to this sort of argument, I feel that you know there is a lot of bias out there about against the EU and the Euro. Um, you know, there's not focus on these um, sorts of countries, um, and nor are there, is there the focus, um, for example, on California, which has supposedly got this wall of debt, which has recently been estimated at three thirty-five billion dollars, um, has been repeatedly on the, um, the precipice of um, default, and of course nobody really focuses on California so much because it's part of, part of this central transfer union where money can be moved around if needed. Um, so, but nevertheless, it, you know, there is the, the risk there and it is a, a problem. But having said that, I think it's very unlikely um, that any state will leave the Euro and um, could be wrong, so you never know. Uh, but, I, I, you know, that's, that's my view. I, I just think it's extreme. Um, I mean, I could retrieve articles from four years ago saying that Greece is going to leave the Euro any day now. Well, it hasn't happened. And I actually spent uh, most, most of last year in um, studying and doing some research in France and Paris. And um, I remember I went to this one, one seminar where um, this one speaker got up and quite confidently said that Spain would leave the Euro by the end of the year. And well, that was kind of a couple of months ago. Well, you know, so, and it hasn't happened. So, I, I just don't think it's going to happen. And the reason I don't think it's going to happen is because, first of all, the consequences of doing so are just going to be far, far worse. I mean, I talked about energy costs going through the roof. Um, and, um, you know, I mean, th there has actually been experience because of, of countries leaving the euro, so to speak, because before the euro, there existed the European exchange rate mechanism. And it's quite complicated, but essentially all that before they had the all the currencies were tied together in a common basket um, against their you know, sort of own group. And then before that, there was another exchange rate um, mechanism where essentially they were all tied to the US dollar. And this goes back to the 70s and the 80s. And, and um, a lot of them left uh, this exchange rate mechanism. Um, and um, inflation just went through the roof. And countries like Sweden and the UK were originally, originally in this, this basket of currencies. Um, and even in places like the UK, inflation was like 20 percent back in the 70s. So there is actually hard evidence to show that if you leave these sorts of baskets, the security of other currencies, that um, inflation will go through the roof. And of course, as I said, you know, no one will. I mean, it, it seriously will be developed. I mean, Greece just simply could not pay. And there would be nobody there to help them out because the EU would just say, fine. In that second paragraph, enormous unmobilised private saving reserves throughout the EU, particularly in the north, if those savings go into Greece, and Greece never pays its debt back, those people won't get their money back either. Well, who knows? But yes, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> but, 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 but that's actually, I mean, essentially the reason I don't think it's going to be felt is because apart from the fact that there are, um, um, it, it just would be <clears throat> catastrophic. Um, essentially, there are all these other resources that, that are available. And the EU, for example, I think has the, um, I could have these the other way but I know that the EU collectively either has the world's largest gold reserves or the second largest after China, and it's got the largest cash reserves or the second largest after China. So massive cash reserves, massive gold reserves, and gold has been really high. And no one, and the EU hasn't been selling gold, but it could. Um, but, um, you know, that, that's just one example. And, I mean, another example is that, um, you know, there was two debt restructurings, or what you sort of call a default when you're not having a default. One was in 2011, when basically the EU um, and the uh, IMF sat down with all the bondholders of Greek debt and said, all right, you guys, you have to take a cut. So they took a 50% cut in the value of their bonds. And BNP Paribas, the French bank, for example, wrote off the value of its Greek bonds by 75%. So this is sort of like having a default when you're not really having one. So um, 
the, um, and, and then on top of that, uh, just last year, uh, essentially they had another uh, debt restructuring, which, so, you know, so there are ways and means to sort of get around it. Um, and, and as I sort of pointed out at the end as well, the e ECB has got enormous reserves, and only recently has it started buying Greek bonds, which has really come to market standing quite considerably. And part of that's all German politics, because the Germans don't believe that it should be used for bonds because they're obsessed with inflation. Historical proof of why that is the case. But, but anyway, essentially, I, I really don't think an uh, exit is, is ever going to happen. Um, and also, too, I think that the, the markets um, and a lot of political commentators and economists have really seriously underestimated the value of the political drive in Europe to actually keep the whole integration project going. Um, and it, it, so it's not just economic, it's also political, and the EU always. So essentially, I should also start, I should also talk about the um, response, um, and I won't get into this too much detail, to, to, in too much detail because it is a bit boring. But, um, essentially, there's essentially three broad areas. Uh, one is the um, uh, efforts to maintain stability in the eurozone. So these include the Greek loan facility, um, these two funds, the EFSM and the EFSF. Uh, which are in Luxembourg, which is just over the border from Germany, where the Germans can see it. Um, <laughs> which is true, it's, it's actually been also that the debt issuances of these two funds is being assisted by the German Debt Management Office. So it's actually also been run by the Germans. But anyway. um, the, um, so essentially, there's um, uh, a whole lot of money there that's also been chipped in um, from the IMF, um, and that money is then. Essentially, lent out to member states, and it's important to point out that um, they are loans. So, you know, there's all this talk in some sections of some countries saying, you know, well, we pay that. But it's important to note that no member state has actually sent any money or given any money to give to any of these other countries. It's all loans. Um, and, uh, for example. Uh, which will never be repaid. Sorry? There are loans which will never be repaid in the case of Greece. Yes. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, yes, but the, the thing is, is that the money is actually raised. The way that it works is that these funds, that the bonds are actually backed, guaranteed by either the, um, by the, by the EU budget. And it's only in the case of default that they're actually drawn on. So most of the money is actually coming from the, um, the, the private sector anyway. So, um, and, uh, and you can actually buy into any bonds and lots of stuff, which I'm not sure that many people really want to do, but anyway. Um, and the other point to make is too, as well, that you know, none of this lending money through these mechanisms is nothing that all of these member states have been doing for decades through the um, European Investment Bank or the IMF. I mean, that's how the IMF works. Countries get together, put money through the IMF, it's lent with a marginal interest rate out to That's how it works. And most countries have got their own state-run uh, uh, assistance and construction banks anyway. And so there's nothing really uh, unusual about the way it's all structured. Um, and as I said, the, 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 the guarantee uh, on the EU budget is actually only drawn upon in the event of default. But as I said, I um, um, yeah, so essentially they've got, together they've all got billions of resources. Um, uh, just move on. Yeah, so the next point, the next area that um, the EU is responding on is fiscal coordination. So essentially coordinating state budgets. Um, there's close commission oversight of all the member state budgets. Uh, in fact, the Commission can request revisions to state budgets. It's not quite a veto of state budgets. It's just they can request a member state to change their accounts. Um, they've also got a penalty mechanism because there's agreed debt at deficit levels, which have been agreed uh, quite some time ago, but all the member states violated it. It's all based on peer system. But supposedly this new penalty mechanism is going to um, ensure that uh, states aren't guilty and, and don't spend too much money or um, get too much debt. 
Um, but nevertheless, it's going to, uh, you know, we've got to see whether it actually works because it is based on peer pressure. But nevertheless, these steps do represent a little bit more power to the Commission, a little bit more closer coordination and uh, one more step towards integration to some degree. Um, there's also a whole lot of plans out there for growth. Francois Hollande came up with a plan with 130 million euros last year uh, about growth. <coughs> It's just all hot air. <coughs> None of the money was new money. It was just basically already there. Um, so the next area is financial regulation. And essentially they've been regulating everything in the EU lately. Um, there's been an overhaul of the banking supervision system because that was one of the big problems identified in the financial crisis. But essentially banking supervisors in all the different states had no idea what was going on and they weren't close to covering so now they've set up new authorities, um, uh, new agencies to sort of oversee all this and coordinate it all. Um, but uh, everything else, Brussels has been a very busy place in the Directorate of uh, the DG, Directorate General for Financial and Economic Affairs, where uh, they've been um, regulating directives, directors pay, credit rating agencies, hedge funds, credit control swaps, you, you know that it's been regulated. So, you know, they're, they're just trying to sort of pull things together. Uh, one of the big issues that, um, that some people feel is that this ring fencing of banks, which is basically where you separate commercial banks from retail banks, so that if the commercial banks go off and do all these strange and bizarre things with new exotic products coming out of New York, then it's not going to pull the retail banking industry down. It's not going to pull the retail side down. So, um, and the UK has been onto this for a while, and it actually can't believe that the EU has been so slow on this. So, I, I think there are some um, what we call traction issues uh, in Brussels with some of these initiatives, um, and that's one of the big things that David Cameron is from the British PM is really um, <coughs> critical of. But, um, but nevertheless, it's a train moving forward. Um, although. <laughs> it's about to crash, but anyway. Um, and of course, yeah. wrap up, Peter, because there is so much I have to cover. <laughs> <laughs> so many mistakes. Well, right. well look, the, ne the next issue that I think, I'll, I'll jump past banking because it's, uh, it's hard, still talking about it. But I think that one of the big issues, this is another hobby horse, is. Um, Another one of the, <coughs> or the I, I think the real issues around the this is what the crisis is. There's no action on the There's a failure to stimulate innovation, no R and D, uh, and not enough R and D money. There's also a lot of funny rules and things like the European Investment Bank and the European Investment Fund, for example, require this have this co-financing rule where member states have to chip in money before the EU will. Well, of course, if member states have got no money, they can't chip in money. Um, and they've also got another rule as well, that projects can't be profit, made for profit, which is a weird sort of anti capitalist thinking. But anyway, I mean, they, the, the, what it essentially means is that some of these funds that could be mobilised to places um, aren't actually um, being sent there. Uh, they've got huge problems in, uh, right across the EU, but particularly um, with welfare reform, um, um, I know the teachers are very, uh, very uh, good, well off in, um, in France, for example, particularly. You can retire quite comfortably and quite early, like at 50. Um, the um, anti business sentiment in a lot of um, countries, particularly in France, I right, single about France with this picture, it's just, uh, it's just virulent um, and it just is a complete lack of incentive. Um, you know, venture capital funds won't go anywhere near them. I mean, companies are just scared to put any money in France because they're scared that the socialist government is going to nationalise them any minute. Um, and, which is not just a threat. I mean, there was a, there was a, a threat from Hollande to nationalise one of the chemical companies that wanted to close down one of the productive factories. So. Um, so these are where some of the issues, uh, these are sort of other issues. These are issues that I think they need to work through together. And they're not just issues isolated countries. These are issues that are pretty much across the board. So in fact they are 
in, these issues are quite common along among lots of countries uh, in Europe. But the other big issue is tax havens. Um, and I think this is a big one because there was a major study released just last year that high net worth individuals had hit $21 trillion of unreported financial wealth and tax havens by the end of 2010. Now that's the equivalent of the entire US and Japanese economies together. And that number is under, it's possibly underestimated because um, it is possibly really more like 32 trillion because the figures didn't include assets such as property and yachts. So, um, so it's an enormous amount of money. And um, that, these report authors, um, who it was written by the consultancy uh, McKinsey, the International Perspective Agency, um, it found that it could have generated tax revenues of between 190 and about 280 million which is twice the amount the OECD countries, OECD countries combined spend on overseas development aid. And it's also more than the entire EU budget of 2013, 150 million. These tax havens, are they the groups or is this the whole So this is the world. So uh, unfortunately I wasn't able to drill down just to Europe. But I guess what I'm sort of saying is that, um, uh, I mean, for example, I'll, I'll sort of move on. Um, essentially, there's, there's a whole lot of efforts to try and uh, tackle these issues. But one of the other problems with not having a combined <coughs> entity by the central government is that they're all working against each other in Europe. Because the UK, for example, recently signed a deal with Liechtenstein in September and um, Switzerland that they reckon would bring in between three and seven billion pounds in revenue to the UK. But under that deal, all of the uh, UK holders of those Swiss bank accounts get to um, be uh, secret. So that completely undermines the EU's effort to try and tackle their um, issues. And but the EU's got its own internal issues because it has separate deal with um, uh, Liechtenstein, Andorra, San Marino, and Monaco. But Luxembourg and Austria blocked that deal in the European Council, which is the Council of all the member states together. So they need to get this, uh, this happening. Um, but the other problem, I, 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 the other question I have to say is like, why do these countries exist? Why do these states really exist? And I really hope that there's no nationalists from Liechtenstein and Marco here. But you know, essentially these are old vestiges of feudal mon monarchy sticks of Europe um, that have absolutely no role in the modern world, really, except that they offer really low tax rates to international um, uh, companies and um, dictators from Africa and. Um, people trying to um, hide their money. So this, this state should not exist. And the fact that Europe <coughs> has come from its political, geopolitical history is this, the fact that they do exist is, is just an anomaly that really needs to be dealt with. Who should they go for Well, um, <laughs> Liechtenstein should probably be uh, absorbed into Switzerland. Monaco should probably be absorbed into France. Um, <laughs> I don't care what happens to them, but... You know, <laughs> Well, I'm sure they. I'm, I'm sure. That, I'm sure they. That some of the citizens probably do. The citizens might have to be encouraged by a foreign army to accept the opposition. Perhaps. Perhaps. I, I don't. I don't uh, suggest that the problem is easy. To just but you know, this is an issue. I think. And, um, but having said that too, I mean, the, the issue of tax evasion is much broader, and I've got some other things here, 4.6 trillion, which is held in offshore financial accounts um, that relates to um, international multi-corporations. And, and they often invest in some of these tax havens for regulatory reasons. So some of them are coming from countries with poor regulatory environments, so they operate legitimately in some of these uh, countries like, uh, or places like Guernsey and Jersey, to try and get better regulatory environments. So there are so-called legitimate reasons for some of these places existing, but there's also some uh, activity that essentially is really undermining the whole uh, integrity of, of Europe as a continent. Um, so essentially to move on and summarise, I'll just to get all this out of the way. There was a German politician earlier on who suggested that Czechoslovakia should have existed. Oh, that's outrageous. <laughs> 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 That's that's not that's not quite.
quite understand that. Yes, no, but there, there is that frivolous attitude to nation states. I mean, how tiny these states are. They have citizens. And if we are serious about democracy, we cannot make frivolous suggestions about those states shouldn't exist because they don't suit our taxation system. Well, actually, right. so I do know that there was an attempted referendum in Wittgenstein recently where some of the um, where, where people tried to challenge the banking laws because apparently the um, the prince in Wittgenstein basically his family run all the banks and so there was an attempt to try it but he has vetoed it so the legislation going through the assembly or the national in Wittgenstein and there was so there's this standoff some of the people who wanted this change to some banking laws were really wanted to get this through but they knew that if this happened, then essentially the prince could move the money somewhere else. So the, the deals didn't go through. So quite, quite seriously, you have to question the democratic sort of in some of these countries. But look, the point, the point I'm really making here is not so much the estate should exist, but essentially these tax havens should exist. And, and, I think, and, and I think that that's really, uh, that's really the issue. But anyway, to, to summarise and finish, <coughs> with a possible solution, I, I feel essentially what we really have Europe is um, um, essentially to develop a federal structure which sooner rather than later, and I think the writing's on the wall that's going to happen eventually, and as we talked about, it's, it's sort of halfway through anyway. And, and I think if you, if, you know, most Europeans I don't think really want to go back to pre uh, post to post war Europe anyway, and host that system. And having said it, I don't think, but it's, even the worst critics suggest that the EU be disbanded, but I think most of the criticism is directed at the Euro and also the way that it's run and the, the lack of balance of power and political structure in Europe. But essentially I think that the EU needs a constitution that very clearly portions powers between the states and federal Brussels, um, which would give the states uh, rights and powers that they feel they should have, and the ECG could uh, educ adjudicate on constitutional issues. Um, and essentially given the EU is halfway there now, I think it's not such a scary idea. Um, and it would provide clarity around issues like dealing with debt, the ability to raise taxes, responsibility for immigration, etc, etc, etc. So um, I think, yes, it is tricky in a democratic context to get everybody on board in Europe, to get, get their, everybody get their like, heads around it. And there is a lot of opposition. But, you know, the EU has come a long way despite the, the vigorous anti-EU critics. So I don't think even getting it through democratically is an expanded problem. But that's my optimism. Might be proved wrong. But uh, I think that, um, you know, if we go back to what the EU was created for, it was created to build this long-lasting piece of Europe. And in that respect, it's been an enormous success. And one of the greatest, most noble projects, I think, that um, any of us have really seen that lifetime perhaps has been a bit of a year.